All right. Well, welcome everyone, and thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Peter, and and everyone else for being here and for having me come tell you the story of of LIGO. Um, so I, I'm going to just take you on kind of a journey, and that's going to be meanderings in the journey that will be a little bit to do with how this all got started, and I'll try to weave in some of the science that's that's that's. Uh, uh, been going on, and I want you to know that it's been the science has been coming out of LIGO, as, my, as many of you might have noticed, at a pretty breathtaking pace. So at some point you might also get breathless, but that's just a warning. Um, first thing I want to say is uh, everything that I'm going to show you about LIGO and Virgo is the work of a, 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 a large collaboration of over a thousand scientists. So please know that I'm just the messenger. And also, I'd like to put out there right up, up front that LIGO has been, the, um, uh, has been funded uh, by the National Science Foundation for the last 40 dec uh, four decades. So uh, let me make all the important announcements first. Then let me tell you something that you all must remember, which was that on February 12th, 2016, so a, a year and a half ago, pretty much every major newspaper in any language that you chose anywhere in the world had a scientific discovery story uh, on the front page. And in many cases, my journalist friends have told me above the fold is even more impressive. Uh, so what I want to do here today is to sort of unpack the science behind these headlines. I also uh, sort of am very tickled. Personally, I actually always imagine, I've been doing LIGO for 27 years, I always imagined that when we made it work, um, it would be sort of a big deal um, in the scientific community. What I hadn't anticipated was that it also kind of caught the uh, sort of the uh, sort of public attention. So here is a sign that was actually photographed in the New York City subway <laughs> and, uh, 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 in, in March 2016. So just a few weeks after the announcement, where it basically claims that it was easier to detect gravitational waves than to find a, a, an apartment with a walk-in closet in New York City. Now, personally, I disagree with that, but I was still very tickled that you know, this was being used for, for such purposes, these discoveries. So that was pretty nice. And then, of course, I'm sure you must have noticed what happened last week, and this was rec recognized uh, by a, a Nobel Prize for uh, uh, Ray Weiss, uh, Barry Barish, and Kip Thorne. And through my story, I'll weave in their, their parts as well. And the, 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 the citation was for decisive contributions to the LIGO detector and the observation of gravitational waves. Uh, I, I'll make a, a slightly editorial comment. I'm, I'm usually, we've all seen how flawed Nobel choices can be. Being very close to this field, I can say this was the right choice. So, so we're very proud of our, 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 our leaders who made this happen. OK. So our story begins with Newton, the story of gravity. And Newton had this very successful universal law of gravitation from dating back to the 17th century. And Newton wrote this sweet little formula that said that if you have two uh, 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 objects of mass m1 and m2, they will feel a mutual force of attraction that's proportional to their masses and inversely proportional to the square of their distances. Now, Newton himself worried about this idea of action at a distance, which was the question of how does mass 1 know about mass 2? How do these two masses influence each other? And in, in, in modern uh, terminology, we would say, what mediates that force? And that question did not get answered for, for, uh, for a couple of hundred years until our next hero of gravity came along, and that was Einstein in the early 20th century. And of course, you all know that Einstein told us that gravity is geometry. He dispensed with this idea of gravity being a force. He told us gravity is geometry, and, and in fact, it is the warpage of space-time. And in, indeed, the picture he painted for us was that when you have massive objects in space-time, they will cause that space-time to curve. And he also wrote a formula. Uh, but as many of you must know from, from your, from your uh, general relativity uh, classes, this formula is not sweet. It is actually perhaps one of the most beastly formulas ever written. And in fact, when you think about the 100-year journey from the time Einstein gave us general relativity to the time that we've been able to make these detections, this, the difficulty of exact solutions to the Einstein field equations plays a role. And I'll come back to that. 
Okay, so Einstein not only gave us in, in from his, his theory that space curves in the, in the presence of massive objects, but he also, out of the theory, out of the field equations, came a dynamical part. And the dynamic, dynamical part was that if the massive object is accelerating, then in fact space-time won't just curve, it will ripple. And this was something that he himself remained deeply ambivalent about, as far as we know, throughout his career and, and, and his life. So I want to just touch on why this was such a difficult thing uh, for, uh, for Einstein. These things he called gravitational waves, they first appeared in his 1916 uh, paper on general relativity. And then eventually there was a mistake, and then he got it right in the 1918 paper. But he actually was very dismissive of them. So let me just say what this was. So he, he made this complete formulation of, of general theory of relativity between 1915 and 1918. And he, got, uh, uh, he in 1918, Schwarzschild proposed stars with so much mass and such a small volume that even light couldn't escape the gravitational pull. This, by the way, came out of Einstein's uh, uh, equations. Einstein actually did not like these dark stars at all. In fact, there's, there's known correspondence between Einstein and, and Schwarzschild of, of Einstein dismissing them as not something nature could reasonably do, but as some mathematical uh, sort of construct that came out of his, his theory. Now, he also vacillated uh, about gravitational waves themselves and their very existence. So in the 1916 paper where he first introduced them, he dismissed them as, as, as having no practical purpose whatsoever. Then in 1936, he actually wrote a retraction in a paper with Rosen. And this is the same Rosen of Einstein, Podolsky Rosen. And the title of this paper was, Do Gravitational Waves Exist? The question mark. And by the time you get to the abstract, the answer was, no, they don't. Then he retracts the retraction after a discussion uh, with Robertson, and this is Robertson of the Robertson-Walker metric. And after that, Einstein goes sort of silent on this question of whether gravitational waves exist or not and so on. And there was actually much controversy about this uh, uh, until uh, a famous meeting in, in Chapel Hill called GR1 for General Relativity 1, the first GR meeting, in 1957. And, but I have to say, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an experimentalist, as are many of you in, in, in the room. And I have to say that experiment and observation have the final say, as usual. So let's take a look at what came about then. So what were the experiments and observations that lead up to these discoveries that we've, that we've been talking about from LIGO? So neutron stars were proposed in 1934 by Body and Swicky. In 1967, Puccini and Gold propose the first rotating neutron stars, which we now know are pulsars. So these are stars which have strong enough magnetic fields that their rotation causes their, their, uh, their light emission to be beamed like a lighthouse. In the same year, in 1967, the first pulsar was observed by, by uh, Bell and Hewish. And then in 1969, Joe Weber announces the first detection of gravitational waves. And this took the scientific world uh, by storm. So Weber uh, built a device like this. It's uh, basically a big chunk of metal, which he instrumented with these, these, these uh, uh, sensors, uh, motion sensors. And his idea was that as a gravitational wave passes through this chunk of metal, it will get it resonating. At, and he, this was a very high quality factor chunk of metal and therefore it would resonate uh, uh, at its resonant frequency and his sensors would pick that up. Now it turned out that uh, uh, because of the simplicity of the idea, a number of people jumped into trying to reproduce Weber's results and no one could and it was, they were eventually found to simply be a, 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 set of, uh, a set of errors in his experiment. But the, but the stage was set, we now had observations of neutron stars. We had Weber making this announcement. Around the same time, in 1971, the first black hole was discovered. And there also raged controversy about whether it was a black hole or not. And then came the, the clincher in 1974, when uh, Hulse and Taylor discovered a binary pulsar system. So this is a system in which two neutron stars are orbiting each other. One of them happens to be a pulsar, so we have this nice lighthouse. We can count the, the, uh, the, the timing of the light pulses. And what, 
general relativity would tell us is that if those are two neutron stars, they are a gravitationally uh, strong enough system and, and, and relativistic enough that they should lose energy to gravitational waves. So these rotating neutron stars orbiting each other should be losing energy to gravitational waves. That energy should come out of the orbit, which means that they should get closer to each other and faster. And that was the measurement that they made over a large number of years, so starting from the discovery of the object in 1974, and these data go all the way down to 2005, and there's even more since then. So the data points are, 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 are their measurement. And then the solid line is not a fit. It's actually the exact prediction from Einstein's formula for how much the orbit of the system should shrink in that number of uh, in, the, in those number of years, uh, given the parameters that they measured using their their uh, their radio um, uh, 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 frequency measurements. And this, of course, impressed Sweden, and they got the Nobel Prize for this discovery in 1993. And that kind of set the stage, gravitational waves exist, neutron stars uh, uh, in, in binaries actually radiate them, but this was always seen as sort of the indirect evidence for Einstein's space-time ripples. Now, Einstein's ambivalence was actually completely justified, so let's just make sure what we, we understand why. So this is a, a simple enough formula, it's the luminosity in gravitational waves, and the scaling shows two things that are of interest. The first is that the size of the object R should be comparable to its Schwarzschild radius, and the Schwarzschild radius is simply the radius of an object of mass m such that the, the escape velocity is the velocity, uh, 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 is the speed of light. And then the other scaling was the, the, uh, this v over c uh, to the sixth power. So immediately, and this was all, this comes right out of Einstein's original uh, quadrupole formula. And so we see right away that the sources must be compact, their, their size must be comparable to their Schwarzschild radius, and they must be relativistic so that the, the velocity of motion of, 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 of matter in the object should be comparable to, the, uh, to uh, the speed of light. And that says that the only reasonable sources one should expect to have sufficiently strong radiation are compact mass objects like neutron stars and black holes, and they must also have rapid acceleration, so that involves orbits, explosions, and collisions. Now, Einstein, the first observational evidence for neutron stars and black holes didn't come in Einstein's lifetime. He died in 1955, and these discoveries came in the 60s. And that, but the most remarkable thing about a man who had so much ambivalence about the output of his field equations was that the field equations have yet to lie. They keep telling us how nature should behave, and every time we go out and measure, nature seems to do that. So general relativity made very firm predictions about gravity, about space-time, and indeed about the black holes that Einstein himself didn't like very much. So we fast forward now to, to almost 100 years later, and I'm going to show a movie of what space-time looks like uh, around two black holes that are orbiting and, uh, and colliding. And there's something, there's something very remarkable about this movie, which is that it's really been almost that hundred years in the making, because this is not some artist's rendition. This is a movie built on exact solutions to the Einstein field equations. And what you'll see is, of course, that the, that the signal of space-time ripples will accumulate on the bottom here as these two black holes orbit each other. The, the two-dimensional plane shows the curvature of space-time near the black hole. So when they're far apart, you just see the little funnels, the, the classic little funnels of, of, uh, of static gravity. And then as these black holes orbit each other, lose energy to gravitational waves, and get closer together, they experience stronger and stronger gra uh, 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 gravity from each other. And you can see that the space-time curvature uh, starts to increase and distort. Uh, the color coding is the, the, the rate of flow of time, and the arrows just show frame dragging. So what you'll see is that the, the two black holes, the, the movie gets slowed down, their horizons will touch, at which moment you'll have the most extreme <coughs> space-time distortions. You can see the signal reaches its maximum just when the two so horizons touch. And then the black holes merge into a single quiescent black hole that, has, that rings its modes for, uh, for a brief time, and then the signal shuts off, and then the gravitational waves travel out into the universe. And like I said, this is actually, this is a solution, this is an exact solution 
from the Einstein equations made by a very large uh, team of, of people who've been working actually for a couple of decades on these, uh, on, getting, uh, uh, on getting numerical solutions to uh, relativity equations. But life wasn't always that good. Back in the late 60s and 70s, this man, Kip Thorne, was at Caltech, and he was among the first people to start asking the question, what is the strength of these waves? Remember at this time, this is now neutron stars and black holes are just starting to be discovered. Ordinary stars that are in binary, stars like our own, uh, like our own sun, have laughably small emission of gravitational waves, and in fact, Einstein must have, we've never found this calculation, but somewhere in his notebooks there must have been a calculation he did with binary stars, which were known in his time, and that caused him to dismiss this whole idea. But Thorne was thinking about what, could, what one could find, and he, early in, already in the 60s and 70s, uh, in, in the late 60s but, uh, in, uh, actually, had put a number, a scale on the amplitude of the gravitational wave, and it was this quantity 10 to the minus 21, and that's for a, 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 gravi a gravitational wave from a pair of neutron stars, typical sort of, you know, 1.4 solar mass neutron stars in a galaxy not too far from our own. So one thing that you should, uh, uh, you know, carry with you is that the amplitude of the gravitational wave falls off as one over the distance. So this is what, what we would experience the amplitude here on the Earth if these pair of neutron stars was, was in sort of in the Virgo cluster. He put a scale on it, and he started to calculate waveforms. And as soon as the scale became known, there was this guy, Ray Weiss, and he started to think about how one might go about measuring this. And remember, he comes now, this is in the late, uh, uh, sort of in the mid to late 60s again. This comes on the tails of, of, of Weber's announcement. And Weiss uh, concludes, that a much more effective way to measure passing gravitational wave is to use a laser interferometer. And the reason he does that is he, one of their effects here on the Earth is that as they pass through, they stretch and shrink space-time distances. And so you can see that the way the interferometer works is that when the two arm lengths are exactly equal, you get perfect destructive interference at the output. When the two arm lengths are unequal, you get more or less light out, and that a measurement of the amount of light at the output of the interferometer gives us a measure of the dis dif difference in the arm lengths. So that was Weiss's idea, and that he was not the only one to have had this idea, but then where he took it was revolutionary. So he was the first to come up with the, the, the understanding that it was completely hopeless to do this kind of experiment at the laboratory scale, of you know, meter scale. And so he was the first to propose that we should make these interferometers four kilometers long. And the scaling is straightforward. The change in, in length of the interferometer is proportional to the passing gravitational wave amplitude, which nature gives us. That's t the 10 to the minus 21 that Thorne calculated. And it's also proportional to the length of the detector. So longer is better. And Weiss then understood that if you made these kilometers long, you would have to have, make a measurement of the relative displacement of these mirrors at the level of 10 to the minus 18 meters. And in 1972, he wrote the seminal document outlining how this should be done. And I, I, the, one of the most remarkable things to, to me, you know, who was, who was hardly even born at the time, is that factors of two came and went from the, those initial calculations he did, but he more or less got everything right. That, is the device we built in the 2000s, okay? So there was a lot of foresight in this. Now, out of this, a bore, a, this bold experiment was born. Thorne and, 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 and Weiss get together in 1976 and decide that we, what they should go for a, a long, it's kilometer long instrument, and that's how LIGO was born. LIGO comprises two observatory sites, one in Louisiana and one in Washington State, and the the L-shaped detectors are four kilometers long, and they have technologies in them that allow them to make these measurements of, of, of 10 to the minus 18 meters relative displacement. Now, so the bold experiment was done by a number of people. So I already talked about Weiss. He was the first one to, to decide that one should use laser interferometers, and they have to make them very long. Horn calculated the waveforms, and he understood that these were some very small amplitudes. 
Then along came Ron Drever, uh, who, who unfortunately died last year, and, and Drever joined this effort in 1979, and he was, added a few innovations to them. He added optical cavities, which are both complex to work with, but also very important for getting these things working at the sensitivities that, that, uh, that were achieved. And then finally, Barry Barish, who understood in the, in the early 1990s that to get these big detectors working, you know, building an observatory is not tabletop science, it's a project, and he then led the, the group to the observatories that you see in these beautiful aerial pictures. Those were constructed under, under Barish's watchful eye. So these were sort of the, 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 the people who kind of are known to have seen this through from beginning to, to, to success. Now, for the young people in the, the room, and especially the women in the room, I always like to remind you that even though the experiment was born this way, the experiment was ex executed by a much different group of people that includes people that look like us today. Okay? So I just want to point out that this was a picture taken at the, a photograph taken in Washington, D.C. at the, at the uh, National Press Club on the day of, of, of the LIGO announcement last year. And these are some of the leaders of the, of, the, uh, of the experiment who were present in the room at the time. So you can just see that you know, demographics do shift. OK, so LIGO then is these two observatories. And the, uh, these L-shaped interferometers are four kilometers long. Now, you need basically two things to make a good gravitational wave detector. On the one hand, you need very still mirrors. You need mirrors that are, are moving by less than that 10 to the minus 18 meters due to all the earthly or terrestrial forces so that they can respond to the passing gravitational wave. And for that, you need uh, some spectacular vibration isolation systems, which look sort of like uh, this system over here. The mirrors also hang as pendulums. And this isolation system gives us uh, an, a, a something on the order of a, a factor of a, a million or better isolation. And then we also hang the mirrors as pendulums, and that gives us another roughly factor of, of, uh, uh, of, of a million. And that gets us to this factor of, of a billion reduction in the vibrations of, uh, of, of the Earth reaching the motion of the mirror. Okay, so that's the one factor of a billion. Then you, say, you succeed. You make this mirror really, really still. That doesn't do you any good if you don't have a way of measuring those tiny motions. And that there enters the, the lasers that we use. The wavelength of the light is, our, is the, the tick marks on our, our ruler. Now, the wavelength of light that we use is about a micron, and we still have to make measurements at the level of 10 to the minus 18 meters. So we need another factor of a billion in precision uh, of, uh, of, of the laser, and that's achieved by very fancy lasers, and it's achieved by lots of laser power. And that laser power, in turn, is actually built up in the interferometers using mirrors that face each other. So eventually, this set of technologies, all funded over many decades by the National Science Foundation, has enabled LIGO. Okay? So that's the, the, the sort of simple sort of detector design part. And that has allowed LIGO to operate in a number of, uh, uh, of phases. So LIGO is always designed to be uh, built as the first instruments were called initial LIGO. They were built between 2000 and, and uh, built and operated between 2000 and 2010. And that's the green curves here. And what are these curves? Many of you are used to seeing them, but for anybody who ha hasn't looked at how we measure the performance of a gravitational wave detector, we measure it in units of frequency on the horizontal axis, and notice that the frequencies go from 10 hertz to, uh, to a few kilohertz, so that's the human audio band. And on the vertical axis is simply the spectral density of strain or, or the gravitational wave amplitude. And what this basically says is that anytime you see a curve like this, a gravitational wave has to have amplitude that's larger than the limiting curve to be able to see it. So initial LIGO was the green curve. I will t tell you this remarkable thing that I already did. This green curve that we achieved in 2010 was the curve that Weiss's original 1972 paper drew. Okay, so that happened. The red curve is, a, uh, is the second phase of LIGO, which we call advanced LIGO. And advanced LIGO is, is operated with, with this sensitivity uh, last year when these first discoveries were made. Those are called observing run one or O1. 
That was not the final design sensitivity of advanced LIGO. Advanced LIGO will, will, uh, is expected to reach the sensitivity of the blue curve, which is about a factor of three better than the, 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 the red curve was. And a number of us are already thinking about what can we do beyond the advanced LIGO design, and we call, generically call that the cyan curve, the upgrade. But it has many other uh, uh, terminologies depending on which upgrade you're thinking about. So this just sort of gives you a historical perspective of how these detectors have pro progressed. And it also tells you, shows you right away that the discovery instruments with the red curve were substantially better than the previous ones with the green curve. And that's what enabled the discoveries. All right, and so now we get to September uh, 2015. And that's the first, uh, the first of the LIGO detections. That's uh, you know, affectionately named GW150914 for the year 2015, the month of September, the ninth month, and the 14th day. That's the naming convention for these sources. So here what we saw was two black holes that collided just as Einstein instructed them to do. Their gravitational waves uh, pass out into the universe. They traveled quite a long ways until they reached uh, our beautiful planet here on, on the Earth. And they arrived on the Earth from the, from the, 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 the southern hemisphere arriving first at our Louisiana Observatory and then seven milliseconds later at our Washington Observatory. Of course, the Earth did not do this. So please, you know, um, but metaphorically, it did. So indeed, these, were the, uh, these uh, signals were measured. And this now are the iconic curves that you've, you've all seen of, of the first LIGO measurements. Uh, these are the uh, data from the two LIGO observatories. There's a few things that I really would like to point out to you that kind of are in keeping with, with everything I've said. So the first thing to notice is that at the moment that the two black holes collided, which is sort of this maximum in the waveform, that corresponds to a strain of 10 to the minus 21. Look at the units here. Or a displacement of a few times 10 to the minus 18. So first thing is check for Thorn, he got that number pretty right. Second is check for Weiss, the measurement corresponded to that. And the other thing that's remarkable is to look at the time scale here. So this, is, this whole plot spans about 200 milliseconds. And so this binary black hole system, and I'll tell you in a moment how we knew they were black holes, you know, they lived, it, it's a system that probably lived for a few billion years and we caught it in the last few hundred milliseconds of its life before it crashed and, and, and sort of obliterated itself. Um, so here is the, the, the theoretical waveform that, that best fits that data. And you can see the, the iconic um, uh, waveform of increasing amplitude and increasing frequency. That's exactly the chirp that, that, that Einstein uh, uh, quadrupole formula would tell us it should do. So this is the phase where the two black holes are just spiraling into each other. And then finally here, they merge. And then you have a little ring down, and the signal should shut off. So from the frequency evolution, we can tell what the mass of the objects were. From the amplitude of the waves, how, since we get the mass from the frequency, we can then tell how far the way they were, what was the distance to the object. And then finally, from the the frequency and decay time of the, of the final ring down, we can tell what the mass and spin of the final black hole were, of the newly formed black hole. And when we put all of that together, we found that these were two black holes that had thir uh, uh, 30 and 36 times the mass of our sun, 29 and 36 times the mass of our sun. They were orbiting each other at half the speed of light at the moment that their horizons touched. I mean, I, 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 I can't tell you how mind-boggling that is, that you take an object that's 30 times the mass of our sun, it's about 200 kilometers in radius, and it's moving at half the speed of light. Come on, hold on to your seats, people. This is, I mean, you know, I like to say that even, you know, science fiction couldn't come up with something as bizarre as this, and yet nature did. Uh, but I will say one other thing, that it, way back in, already in the 1980s, Kip Thorne had already described a scenario like this one. So his, you know, Einstein's equations have been telling us this for a long time, okay? So the system was 1.3 billion light years away. 
And remarkably, because we can measure the mass of the final black hole and those, that of the initial black holes, we could tell that three times the mass of our sun was radiated away as gravitational waves in these few hundred milliseconds. So it's a spectacular explosion. OK. We could do more than just say these were black holes. We could say we could infer what rate of black hole merger should have. Remember, until this discovery, we did not even know if binary black holes existed. We did not know what mass range they should be in. We did not know if they should be in binaries. So this was the first time that we could say what's the rate at which we, these mergers are occurring in, in our universe. And that led to a rather weak limit. But you can see uh, you know, before this discovery, the lower bound included 0. So this is a rate at which these black holes are, 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 are emerging that we believe. And in fact, subsequent discoveries have borne this, this rate out. I'll say more about that. We could also ask the question, does general relativity correctly describe this black hole merger? And this is a really fun thing to, to, uh, uh, to look at. So this is a whole bunch of, of coefficients for expanding the Einstein uh, uh, equations in terms of Newton's formula. So you can just say Newton had a theory of gravity, and you can, make a, you can tailor expand it to try and see how well it matches Einstein's. And the best limits we had on how well, a, how relativistic a system was and how well general relativity described it before LIGO's discovery was this double pulsar. But look at the difference between the double, the, 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 um, the um, parameters of the double pulsar. The double pulsar had a mass about the, the mass of our sun. These are orbiting each other at velocities that are about a thousandth the speed of light. And their rate of change of frequency, remember that rate of change of frequency that I showed in the waveform was a part in 10 to the 12. Whereas for the black holes that LIGO saw at merger, these were 30 times the mass of our sun, half the speed of light, and the orbital period uh, was changing at, at, uh, you know, at, at a rate at, as almost as big as the period. And as a result, this is a far, far more relativistic system. And you can see that very quickly, the blue bands were what was limited by the pulsar, which means no limits at all. It doesn't say very much. And LIGO's observations could put much more stringent limits. And this plot, basically, even if you don't follow anything else about it, what it basically says is that so far, so good. General relativity is the, the best description of the, of the binary black hole merger. One could also ask if these if this measurements could say anything about the nature of the graviton. Now, in general relativity, the graviton would be a spin to massless particle. But you could ask, what if it didn't, wasn't that? What if it deviated from that? Could we tell from the me measurements that we made what, uh, what that deviation would be? And that allows us to put a limit on the mass of the graviton. Again, the most stringent limit compared to any other uh, measurements done, because this is the most relativistic uh, 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 sort of strong gravity source we've seen. And we could put a limit on the mass of the graviton at, at less than 10 to the minus 22 um, eV. Now, observing run one had this flagship event that I've talked about, that was uh, the September 14 event, but it also had another confirmed event that same year in December, uh, and an, a third event which sort of has a 90% chance of being a, a, a black hole. So we call it a, a reasonable candidate, but we don't call it a confirmed black hole event. And that kind of gives us the parameters of these various, uh, these three observations in observing run one. On the left, we saw, show what the masses of the two objects were, and you can see that the the blue, which is the first one, st is the, had the largest masses, so it's still the strongest event, the one we saw the most, the, the loudest. Similarly, you can tell what the the spins of these were, uh, these black holes were, and most interestingly, on the bottom right, you can tell what the distances were, and for the the, the loud events, the distances are well constrained. For the, the event that was, was only a 90% confidence event, you can see that the, the, the distance is first twice as far away. That's why it was weaker. And therefore, we can constrain it worse. So that's what all happened in observing run one. But then there was observing run two, which observing run one, by the way, ended in January of 2016. Then we did a whole uh, almost uh, year, 10 months of, of, of 
of um, improvements to the instruments, and then they came back on in November 2016 through August 2017. And this time, there was something else that happened as well. Towards the end of the, the observing run two, on August 1st, 2017, the Virgo detectors joined the two LIGO detectors. And this then happened on, so this is again 2017, August, on the 14th day of August 2017, we saw the first triple detection with the LIGO and Virgo detectors, so two LIGO detectors and the Virgo detectors. This was their performance at the time that these, that this, th these, um, uh, measure, uh, these events were measured. You can see the LIGO Louisiana or Livingston uh, detector was performing the best. Washington was doing pretty well at high frequencies, comparable, but at low frequencies it had some excess noise that, that, uh, that, that had, had, is being solved now. And then Virgo had just come on the air, and so it was operating with a, a, a factor of few lower, uh, sense, uh, less sensitivity. But indeed, the signal was seen in the loudest and the most sensitive event uh, detector, but also at Hanford and, and in, in Virgo. And this was the, the first triple detection. And in between that, earlier that year, on, in, on, on January 1st of 2017, we had also seen a black hole. So now we are able to start looking at the populations of black holes. And one of the most amazing things that we see right away is this is on the vertical scale here is the, the mass of the black hole in units of solar mass. And everything we had known about black holes in these stellar mass black holes before the LIGO discoveries are in this bottom corner here. And those came from X-ray studies. So these are, are objects that we have inferred to be black holes because these black holes have a companion star, but it's a, it's, a real, it's, a, it's, a, it's a matter star, where matter is falling onto the black hole. And as the black hole accretes that matter, it glows in the x-ray. So the x-ray observations had sort of pinned the masses of these black holes to be below 20 solar masses. And LIGO, the population that LIGO is seeing, the, 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 the parents' uh, black holes, are all significantly heavier, and some of them much heavier. And so you can see that we're starting to probe a population of stellar mass black holes that we haven't known existed. In fact, it's, it set up a pretty big puzzle for us, because we don't actually know how these black holes grow to be you know, 25 or 30 solar masses. The, the, Normal formation mechanisms for black holes are that they're formed when an ordinary star goes supernova. But ordinary stars don't get to be of mass, you know, 30 solar masses. There's, there, there are mechanisms in the star that, that constrain them to be sort of 10 solar masses or, 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 or less. So this is a mystery, but we're starting to, to, to be able to at least look at this population. Now, what else are we learning from these systems that we've seen? So we've seen five systems so far, five black hole systems. Uh, 4.9, if you think of the, one of them as, as, as the 90% uh, significance. Uh, so tests of general relativity, we are certainly, I've shown you, we're doing, uh, we're, we're looking at the dispersion. And from the, those, those uh, uh, kinds of tests, we have the tightest constraint on, on, on the graviton mass. We also have the tightest constraints on these post-Newtonian parameters, which is simply another way of saying, is general relativity correct? And for these systems so far, yes. Now, it turns out that with the addition of Virgo to the network, we are able to, for the first time, say something about the polarization of the gravitational wave. So the two LIGO detectors are co-aligned. The two Ls are kind of aligned with each other. General relativity tells us that the gravitational waves should be polarized and they should have a purely tensor form. And because Virgo is not aligned with the two LIGO detectors, we can start to, to probe what the polarization would be. And the, the, in the, the preliminary indications are what we can say is that, that, that the polarization favors the pure tensor form of GR. But there'll be more coming on this. We need more detailed studies to say, say uh, something more definitive. On the astrophysics side, we are now able to say what, you know, what kinds of, of merger rates we have. So not, not only that we have black holes that, that merge, but at what rate they're doing that. And we have also, for the first time, perhaps the slightest hints of evidence that the spins of the two black holes are, 
are either very small or misaligned. And this has very important implications for the formation of black holes. So let's say, take a quick look at that. So there are two formation scenarios that people think of for how binary black holes form. So the one formation scenario is that they're born as twins. And what that means is that there's a, there's a binary star, there's, there's a, you know, a binary star pair. One of them goes supernova, but somehow retains the, the companion. Then the other one goes supernova, and that's how they form. And if that were the case, because of the mass transfer that happens from one star to the other, that will favor aligning the spins, because mass transfer tends to align the spins. On the other hand, if you look at scenarios of dynamical capture, where an individual black hole is roaming around in, 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 in a dense stellar cluster and meets another black hole and dynamically captures it, then you would have no reason to believe their spins should be aligned. So these are the two different formation scenarios, and our, we have maybe the slightest hints uh, of the systems we've seen so far, of which only one of them actually has enough cycles for us to be able to to, uh, to measure the spin, that it might slightly flavor the, the, uh, the, the, the small randomly oriented spins. So this is the kind of, of black hole uh, 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 astrophysics that we're starting to be able to do. Now, what about localization on the sky? So with these first four observations, which were done only with, with uh, the two LIGO detectors, these gravitational wave detectors are, are like our ears. They're not very good at localizing where, where the sound comes from. And as a result, you can see that they, they have large swaths of, of uh, area on the sky where we think the source should be. Now, if at the time of the, the, the discovery of the first, the, the, of the first discovery of our uh, 15 or 9, 14 discovery, if Virgo had been on the air, then Virgo would have helped localize this to that uh, level. So you could see that having a, another detector uh, with a large baseline is very advantageous. And this is something that, that the astronomy community is particularly very, very keen about, because one of the things that we'd like to do is to be able to take a gravitational wave observation and follow it up with optical telescopes. And and, and in the case of black holes, we may not expect to see very much, unless they are living in some sort of rich gas environment. But certainly for neutron stars, we ex very much expect that the, that the merger of two neutron stars will also be accompanied by a, a spectacular light show. So then with Virgo now on, uh, on the air for that, that, that newest detection uh, from August 14th of this year, this was what, what the, the localization was with Virgo. You can see how much better we've done. And this is a 60 square degree patch as opposed to a 1,000 square degree patch. And indeed, if you zoom in, you can actually see that this big uh, um, banana shape uh, is what the initial localization was with only the two LIGO detectors. And then once we added Virgo, we could zoom in on the, on the, the green spot. And then, of course, a much more detailed, coherent analysis with the three detectors give, gave us the purple spot. But we went from, a, uh, from 1160 square degrees with just the two LIGO detectors to a 60 square degree localization. And that really motivates more detectors with wide separations and non-degenerate orientations, which then, so let me just, uh, I'll skip this in the interest of time. So there is a global network of gravitational wave detectors coming up. So the two LIGO ones in the U.S. and the Virgo detector in, in, in Italy, it's a French-Italian collaboration. Virgo is a three-kilometer long detector. Also in Germany is a 600-meter detector called GEO, which has been sort of, it's now too short for it to contribute to, to um, observations, but it has been a very important instrument in, in understanding, the, uh, in deploying new technologies. Kagra is a three kilometer long uh, a detector that's under construction in Japan. And then in, there is a plan to install a, a, an identical LIGO detector at an observatory in India. And then finally, of course, there is the space observatory, LISA. Now let me just say, LISA, whilst these terrestrial detectors, they all cover sort of the same, roughly the same frequency band from the human audio band, it turns out. The, from 10 hertz to 10 kilohertz, 
Lisa actually covers sort of the millihertz to, 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 hertz, uh, to, to 100 millihertz range. So it's very different frequencies. And that means Lisa has access to very different kinds of sources. Lisa can't see these stellar mass black holes or neutron stars whipping around each other. What Lisa would see are the supermassive black holes that are at the centers of galaxies, for example, so when galaxies merge. So let me now end just by telling you why has this all been so exciting. I started my talk by showing you newspapers, by showing you Nobels. So what's this all about? So certainly this has the, been the first direct observations of gravitational waves. This is the first time that we are directly observing the actual ripples of space-time. These bumps and squiggles that we see in our data, these are a direct measure of the ripples of space-time themselves, of itself. It's also the first observations of binary black hole collisions. So, and as I've said, there are two things that came out of this. There's the mystery of how do we get to these tens of solar mass black holes and how do they form binaries? Okay, so that was, you know, this is the beauty of discovery, it asks new questions. We also are able to say for the first time that Einstein's uh, general relativity theory works in this very extreme gravity limit, a strong field limit. Now, there's no reason for us to, 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 to think this was a done deal. If, you all, if you'll recall, you know, Newton had this very successful theory of gravity that worked all over the solar system, but it failed for the orbit of Mercury. And it failed for the orbit of Mercury because Mercury is the closest planet to our sun and gravity was stronger there and it needed the corrections of Einstein's GR. So there's no reason for us to sit back and think, well, Einstein has it all figured out for black holes, but what we can say is so far, so good. And then finally, I have to say this is something where, which makes me immensely proud as an experimentalist and someone who's sort of spent my entire career uh, building the experiment that the damn instrument works too. Okay? And it works with absolutely breathtaking precision. So these are the things that are important for these first discoveries. But I will leave you with this thought that this is not what these discoveries will be remembered for. What these dis what's more important than these individual discoveries is the, the, the advent of a new tool. It's really that we've turned on this completely new way to observe the universe. And actually, for the first time, we are able to use gravity instead of light. And so I think there will be unimaginable uh, new discoveries that I won't even you know, bore us with enumerating because my imagination is not big enough for this. So let's then just look at what happened in the case of telescopes and Galileo. We believe Galileo was the first person to point a telescope uh, at the sky. And it was a very modest little telescope. It was a little one and a half inch uh, uh, a refractor. And what he observed with his telescope was also quite modest by, by, by modern standards. In fact, most people don't remember what Galileo observed with his first telescope. What he is remembered for is the paradigm shift that he made, that he taught us to look to the sky, not through our naked eyes, but through an instrument. And since then, we went from, from building 100-inch instruments on the Earth to putting 100-inch telescopes in space. Now we're building 25. Uh, meter to 30 meter scale telescopes. In the meantime, we've also added all the different wavelengths of light to, to the telescopes that we observe, including radio, which I, I, I'm sorry I uh, didn't have up there. And that's really been the progression from these first telescopes that, that Galileo built. And so I believe that's also what we can look forward to with gravitational waves. The gravitational wave uh, spectrum is just as broad as the electromagnetic spectrum. It spans 20 orders of magnitude. And what we have done is we have just started to observe these fastest gravitational waves from rotating neutron stars and black holes with these terrestrial detectors like LIGO and Virgo. When LISA, the, the space observatory, starts observing, it will look at gravitational waves that have periods of hours to uh, 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 to, um, to second, and um, going farther back, you know, pulsar timing experiments will look at, at uh, gravitational waves uh, at sort of at the nanohertz region, and then finally, when we get to looking at the polarization of the cosmic microwave background, that lets us observe waves that have basically the, the, the uh, periods that are the size of the universe. And that's what you, we all have to look forward to in the coming decades to centuries. Thank you. Okay. 
So the question is, there has been a research on, uh, on having underground gravitational wave observatories. And is, is that uh, something that's, that's, that's useful or not? So the first thing to say is, the advantages of going underground are indeed for the low frequency uh, end. That's where the, the vibrations are. It turns out that there is, an, there is a particular um, noise source uh, that isn't just seismic vibrations that we can damp away or, or filter away with our, our damping systems. It's known as Newtonian, as the Newtonian noise. And what it is, is it is actually dynamical changes in local G. And those dynamical changes could be due to clouds passing overhead or could be due to density sh uh, uh, shifts of, uh, as seismic waves pass underneath these, these mirrors. And for that, those problems going underground gets better. So we, we think we, we, we know that. Now, could you do as well by instrumenting these mirrors with arrays? And now we're talking about serious numbers of arrays, you know, in the tens to hundred arrays of size, seismic sensors and just uh, subtract out this, this background. That's been tried as well. And whether you go underground or you do these seismic arrays, are, it's the jury is out. They're both giving sort of improvements that are in the, in the sort of factors of two and th oh, to, to, to three. Now, I will say one interesting thing. The Japanese detector, Kagura, is already underground. So the Japanese have chosen to do two things that, are, that none of the other observatories are doing in this generation. They've decided to go underground right from the get-go, and that's to address this problem a little bit. So it's, by the way, it's in the same, it's in the Kamioka mine, just where the, uh, the, the Super-K uh, detectors are, the Kamiokande detectors are. And the other thing that they've decided to do is to also make their, their, their mirrors cryogenically cooled from the get-go, and that removes thermal jitter. And, uh, and uh, so, you know, I think, I think we'll see how well that goes, but that they're already trying to address this question you ask. So. Sure. Sure, I'll take a question here, I guess. Uh, yeah. uh, so, um, the new, if, if one ever saw neutron stars, the implications are two things that make neutron stars different than black holes. The first is that neutron stars are made of matter, and that means that you can start to actually look at, 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 at these dynamics in the presence of, of, of matter, including things like you know, it determining the equation of state of, of, of nuclear matter. Neutron stars actually, as, as, I mean, I shouldn't say this in front of all, all of you guys, but neutron stars have 10 times the, the, the density of, of an atomic nucleus. So, so there's a big uncertainties in the equation of state. The other thing that I think is very, would, you know, that if and when neutron stars are detected, it's going to be very exciting, is that we expect neutron stars to be accompanied, the gravitational waves from neutron stars should be accompanied by an electromagnetic emissions as well. And so that would give us an opportunity to actually point telescopes and do, you know, make a complete picture of what's going on in these, in, in these objects. And, and there is very good reason to want to do both because the gravitational waves, the, the, most matter is completely opaque, uh, 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 transparent rather, to gravitational waves. So the gravitational waves actually come out before the, the, the photons can escape. And that gives, us, that gives us a glimpse into processes that the photons can't. But then once the, the mergers happen, the photons are carrying out a lot of the energy. So, so it's a, it, it would be a very interesting no matter what. Question, yes? So the question is, if you have two orbiting uh, uh, black holes, that would define a plane. And does the orientation, the inclination angle of that plane relative to the detector uh, matter for our signals? Yes, very much so. And when I showed you that very simplified picture of how we get mass from the frequency evolution and we get distance from the amplitude, 
It, in the reality, it's a 14-parameter uh, you know, uh, you know, search, and inclination angle is among those. So we can rough, you know, very, you know, sort of not very well, but somewhat constrain the inclination angle. So, so can we go to the way back? I always fear that we forget the back of the room. So. So the question is, how, how good of a timing system do you need to have to do these coordinated measurements, these coincident measurements? So it, it turns out that, that, the, that the, the timing systems are, 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 are good to, to uh, fractions of a microsecond, and these, the, the timing differences from, you know, between the observatories are on the millisecond scale. So timing does not uh, get in the way. If you ask, where all the uncertainties come from when we make the uncertainties in, in, in the measurement. By the way, I, I, I kind of gloss over the fact that there are big uncertainties. Even when I say 36 solar masses, it's plus or minus 5. Uh, those uncertainties come actually from the calibrations of the in individual instruments. That they do not come from the timing between instruments. Yes, absolutely, yes. So we certainly do that for individual signals in each detector, but also as a coherent network. So we, that's, in fact, how we get the, the limits on the dispersion. So. so does it move the speed of light? Yes. Did I not say that? Yes, yeah, so indeed, yes, so, the, yes, so uh, uh, the evidence is that, yes, that they are going at the speed of light to the, to the level that we can measure. Look, I mean, to do better, you need higher signal-to-noise ratio events, or you need many more, but at the level that we have, yes, speed of light is still good. GR, that's part of the test of GR, because GR predicts that, and that's what we see. Yeah, so the question is, can I say a little bit more about how we achieve this sensitivity of 10 to the minus 18 uh, meters with, with, with the detectors? Uh, uh, yeah, especially if you uh, the wavelength is at minus. So it's, yeah. uh, so you, it sends the variation of the mean sun, that is one million of the wavelength. That's right. Yeah, so let me just say, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer both sides. So the one side is the, 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 the vibration um, isolation. And there, the simple way, even, you know, you know undergraduate physics will, will, is, is sufficient to understand that. So if you want to make a, a, an, a seismic filter, one easy thing that you could do is you could hang the object you want. So let me give you an example. Suppose you are, you, you, your bedroom is on top of a, a, a garage door. And every time your neighbors come in, the garage door opens and vibrates your bed and it wakes you up at night. So what you could do is you could take your, your bed and you could hang it from, uh, as a pendulum from bungee cords. And as long as the natural frequency of oscillation of that, of that pendulum is lower than the frequency of the garage door that you're trying to filter, you will, it will act as a seismic filter. Okay, so that's the principle. Now, of course, this is not a very good example because most people get woken up by the acoustics, not the vibration. So that wouldn't work in the case of the garage, but the principle of isolation is Now you come, so, and that you do it just, you do it if you hang from two pendulums or cascade of pendulums, each pendulum gives you this one over F squared isolation. You can design that. Um, then comes the question of the light, right? So you say it's completely correct that the wavelength of the light is, is one micron. And if you look at, if you think about how, say, the Michelson-Morley experiment was done, in the case of the Michelson-Morley experiment where they used a, simi a, a, a similar interferometer, I mean, they were using their eyes. So what they could tell is the, the difference between constructive and destructive interference, all the light or, or very little light. Right? Now we have detectors 
that can tell the difference between, you know, one nanowatt and two nanowatts of, of power. So within that, so, so from all the light to no light is, 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 is lambda over four, wa quarter of a wavelength. And so we can go down to, you can cut that into as many pieces as you want. It depends on, on, the, on your resolving power for the number of photons that you count. Okay, that's what limits it. So where does that limit come from? That limit actually comes from, a, the, a laser is actually a Poisson distributed light source. So if you measure, n number of photons for signal, you, are, you must have square root of n of noise. And that sets the limit. That's your resolving power for, for and that's why we use so much laser power, because the signal to noise ratio goes as the square root of the number of, of photons. So that's where really, in the end, what we're doing is we're creating, we're, we're getting to resolutions that are a billion times better than the wavelength of light by using you know, the, 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 the quantum statistics of the light. So does that, I mean, I could do 10 talks on this, right? Because, but, uh, but that's probably good. We have time for about one more question. There's one right there in the middle of the room. Yeah, so that's a really good question. I know that we certainly do in the analysis, you know, we, we determine the, the source frame frequency, but I'm not sure whether the redshift is accounted for or not. So I don't know the answer to your question. It's a good one. They must put in the redshift. Yeah, the, um, the redshift is there for uh, just the, 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 the Hubble uh, shift is there for sure. But then in addition, there will That I don't know is the piece. Yes, it's a good question. I just don't know. Let's thank Nergis again.